So uh, good morning, everybody. This is the call with uh, wastewater operators that we've been um, engaging in on a regular basis, Mass DEP, with the uh, the operators since really you know just about spring of 2020. Um, a reminder that the call is being recorded, and as we always do, we'll uh, we'll post the recording on our Mass DEP website um, as a resource. Uh, for folks along with other materials that we've uh, put there. Um, on the call today, we're joined by uh, our assistant commissioner and apparently webmaster, Kathy Baskin, um, we're Leldon Langley, Mary Beth Chubb, John Murphy, Robin McNamara, and key staff from uh, our headquarters and regional offices. Again, we want to make sure that we're all hearing the same. <laughs> Um, information in case there are items, follow up items to work on. Um, we are always thankful to be joined by uh, Denny Dart of US EPA. Um, I would say we are especially appreciative of Denny being here today. I'll have more to say on that in a moment, but I uh, I want to uh, op uh, you know open open up our, our presentation and see if there are any uh, updates that you'd like to provide, Denny. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I do have a few items I can share today. Um, just checking, you can hear me, right? We hear you fine. Okay, very good. So probably the biggest news is that yesterday, EPA released a new memo regarding PFAS. Um, this was new to me, and so I don't really have anything I can say about it but um, it is a memo that addresses PFAS discharges um, through MBDS permits and through pretreatment programs. Anyway, Kat Kathy Baskin will share a copy of the document and there is a press release that she will put a link for in the chat. Um, I can just say that uh, having read the press release myself, the memo recommends use of current sampling and analysis methods in uh, MPDS permits, as well as through pretreatment programs. And they encourage uh, POTWs to impose technology-based limits on sources of PFAS discharges. Um, I also wanted to mention there is an upcoming training on December 15th. It's from one to two. It's on creating the water workforce of the future. It's a whole webinar, webinar series dealing with this problem of, of how do we staff our treatment plants? And uh, that'll be in the chat as well, the link to sign up for that. And then thirdly, um, some good news. EPA just issued a press release on a pretty dramatically improved rate of compliance nationwide among NBDS dischargers. Um, I wanna say that Massachusetts uh, has always had a very low uh, violation rate. We've always been in compliance with the, the national goals and we kind of led the charge on this. And that's very much thanks to all of you, you know, who maintain compliance with your permits and, and make sure and submit your uh, discharge monitoring reports. So anyway, there's a link to the uh, press release in the chat as, chat as well. So finally, I just want to say thank you to all of you and, uh, Farewell, because I will be retiring December 30th. All right, thank you. Back to you, Commissioner. Well, Jenny, um, I really wanted to, um, you know, first of all, thank you for all those updates. But um, on behalf of everyone at DEP, and I will be presumptuous enough to speak to everybody, as for everybody on this call, we really want to thank you for your years of service. I have personally had the pleasure of being involved in issues that You've worked on at EPA over the past decades. Um, you've always um, expected the best in terms of protecting public health and the environment, but you were always someone that was willing to work with people, collaborate with people, make sure that the information we all need is out there. So, um, you know, we we cannot thank you enough for the for the work you've done, and um, really want to wish you the best on your next chapter. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I couldn't be uh, more proud of uh, the improvement that, you know, we have all made in water quality in Massachusetts. And, you know, it certainly isn't just EPA, it's MassDP and it's every discharger, everyone has done their part. So. Great. 
All right. Well, thank you. And all the best to you, too. Thank you. And all the best to you. Well, great. Um, let's see. We will um, now um, we are fortunate to have John Murphy on the call to discuss operator training and licensing. Um, John, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks, Commissioner. And uh, congratulations, Denny, on retirement. Um, the Wastewater Board of Certification uh, continues to meet business as, as usual. We have our next board meeting scheduled for Friday of next week. Um, and like I said, things are, are moving smoothly through the board. Um, the MWAT classes, so the, the, the training classes to prepare for the exam, we are scheduling those now for the spring to be partial, virtual, and a few in-person classes. Uh, we have a meeting with the training advisory committee on Thursday next week to go over that, and that will set up the, the schedule for the spring. Exam continues to, to work fine. Um, if there are any issues, I always recommend reaching out, sending me an email if you are having any issues scheduling the exam or any issues with the exam sites. I, I like to keep on that and, and, and make sure that those sites are functioning properly. And last is the MAWIA, the Massachusetts Water Environment Association. Quarterly meeting is this afternoon at one. I just got an email from them saying you can still register. So if you're looking for some training this afternoon, the MAWIA quarterly meeting is scheduled. And that's it from the board. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, John, and uh, thanks for staying on in case there are any questions in the, in the follow-up. Um, let's see, and we are also uh, fortunate today to be joined uh, by Ed Keeley of the Department of Housing and Community Development, and Ed will be providing an update on the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, which provides funds to assist low-income households with water and wastewater bills and is going to undergo, I guess, some changes this winter. So Ed, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thanks commissioner. Yeah, so for just quick background, this program was set up two years ago through uh, ARPA and it's fun with Massachusetts funding is about $18 million. Last season, we spent about 1.5 million in uh, payments to households, water and sewer bills. Um, and last year, we only did an, uh, paid the arrearage of those bills up to $1,500. This year, we've asked permission from Health and Human Services to change that program to do the arrearage program plus a rate reduction um, for current or future use. We're asking to set the benefit around $400, and we submitted that probably three, four weeks ago, and it usually takes four to six weeks for HHS to approve. Um, the programs that run through our community action agencies that serve LightHeap, we use one, one application, the LightHeap application for both programs. All the eligibility determination is done on our side, nothing for the water utilities to do um, on the eligibility side. Then once they're deemed eligible by the local agency, we have a, a water portal that they would put into um, the information into uh, the street address account that we have on file for them. And then the water utility or sewer utility would then put in what the arrearage is, if, if they have an arrearage and just verify that the count number is right. Then it goes back to our agencies. They would do a check run, you get paid and the amount goes onto their account. Um, we have to spend this money by September 23rd or 2023. Um, with what we have in place or what we're putting in place, we think that'll be easily achievable. There is talk um, in Washington DC, this is, this is the only funding we have right now, but there is discussions in Washington DC to set up a permanent funding source for this program. So I'm, I'm hoping it continues after this season as well. And I'll hang on if there's any questions and concerns. And oh, um, last last spring, you should, you should have received a letter um, from your community action agency that serves your area informing you of the program and how to get involved in it. If you didn't receive anything or you don't remember it, um, I'll put my email in the chat and you can reach out to me and I'll connect you with them. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for that update, and thank you for your your work on that program. Um, just a just a few quick updates before we open the the floor, or the virtual room, whatever uh, we do on Zoom, for uh, questions and comments. Um, first, um, as you know, we are now implementing the new sewer notification law for um, for CSO and other types of discharges. Um, we did have a grant program to help um, 
uh, utilities uh, 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 respond to those types of uh, issues that are required under the new notification that that uh, RFR closed on November 30th and we're in the process of making um, grant award decisions. Again, we're trying to keep a lot of material up on our website and keep current. Um, and uh, again, we appreciate everyone's work in um, in working with us to comply with with the new regulations. And uh, we had, um, you know, um, it was up this summer and um, many of you were reporting under the new requirements and we appreciate that. Um, secondly, um, you know, we're doing a lot of work right now with a draft uh, rulemaking. Um, the updates to our Title V, um, our Title V program um, as it relates to communities um, with uh, nitrogen issues. Um, you know, as you may have heard, um, for, and this affects, uh, significantly affects uh, the Southeast, uh, the Cape and the Southeast communities. Um, we've uh, some draft rules out that um, for public comment that um, off, uh, you know establish new requirements for for Title V systems or the ability for communities to engage in a watershed permit um, type of activity to provide the community more flexibility to design uh, wastewater treatment solutions to address nitrogen issues. Um, that comment period is due to close December sixteenth. I I do acknowledge that we've had requests. Um, um, you know, to think about additional time and we are, we are considering all of that. So I would say, stay tuned to our website. We will, you know, make our intentions known pretty soon. Um, and, um, you know, keep you all posted if, if that's an issue that you're all working on. Uh, finally, I note that, um, it's probably more important for DEP than it is for all of you, but, uh, to the degree you are thinking of, um, visiting or mailing something to DEP in Boston, we have moved. It, it's hard to believe after 50 years, but DEP actually has moved. We've uh, we've gone from uh, one winter street. Uh, we're now co-located in, you know, this hybrid work environment. We're co-located with other energy and environmental agencies at, in the Saltonstall building at 100 Cambridge Street. So all that contact information is up on our website. Um, you know, again, we're keeping, given what's happened with COVID and given the transition to hybrid working, we're working hard to make sure that phone numbers for people are up to date. As you know, a lot of people now are relying on, um, you know, the individualized cell phone numbers as opposed to going through our switchboard, which has been the case for the past few years. We keep that information up to date and you can always uh, find people via our website. Similarly, our Northeast Regional Office, um, you know, lost its lease at its current location. So it is in the process of undergoing a move um, and uh, it will be uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, moving to a, a site, I believe in Woburn. All of that information will be up on the website as well and we'll continue to try to make it as easy to reach us as possible during this time of transition. So um, with that, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think I've seen a few questions come in through the comments. We'll, we'll go through those questions. Um, and then, you know, we'll, uh, you know, like I said, in any time anyone wants to either virtually raise their hand or, or, you know, unmute themselves there, you know, we'll, we'll make that, we'll make sure that we're getting through those questions and comments, but why don't we start with what's already come in through the chat? I'm, I'm happy to read those out to you, commissioner, if you'd like. Um, they seem to both be related to residuals. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first one is, is there any news about sludge disposal costs or plans in Massachusetts or New England? Mm -hmm. so, I, might, I might actually ask you, Kathy, I know you've been working with our, our colleagues on New EPIC. You know, it's fair to say that you know, sludge is a big, you know, it's a, it's a big and important issue. It was even before PFAS. Um, you know, it was even before the regulatory landscape on PFAS change, you know, the options for, uh, uh, you know, disposal of sludge and certainly PFAS has, has you know, in introduced additional challenges. So, uh, Kathy, I don't know if you want to talk about the study or any of the work that New EPIC has done that, that you're aware of. Um, sure. And I think 
Jennifer Lichtensteiger might be on today too. So she could also speak about the New EPIC study, but um, New EPIC prepared a study for the six New England states and New York, um, looking at sludge volume that's generated, um, how much is land applied. For example, we know that 38% of the um, sludge generated in Massachusetts is land applied. Um, and there's certainly been um, discussion with um, Mickey Nowak, who I not, I'm not sure he is on the call today, um, but he's uh, with Mass Water Environment Association. And he's informed me that there are several utilities whose um, costs to manage residuals have increased um, mm -hmm. as capacity for landfills, is more constrained, um, incineration is limited. And of course there are some concerns um, even regionally around land application with, uh, for example, the legislation in Maine, which um, is now prohibiting land application. So um, we certainly see this as um, an important issue and we're um, taking a very close look at it. Um, Jennifer, if there, if you want to unmute, you could describe the study that Nui Pick uh, finished up this year. Uh, I think you're. We don't hear you. Maybe you could put a post um, of the study in the chat. And, and that would that would let folks um, take a look at it after the meeting. Yeah, I'll put that. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can. Okay. Um, so thank you. I think you did a good summary of um, what was in the report. I'll put um, I'll go look it up and put a link in the chat. It did focus on 2018 data and 2019 data in Massachusetts because we had already collected, um, or you had already collected, um, Mass EC. Um, information from 2018. It did have some information on costs. Um, however, we didn't have a lot of responses. So I would um, note that NACWA did a report on costs for biosolids and options, and um, they are updating that. And we think in at the beginning of 2023, there'll be some additional information on costs for that. Um, Keep your eye out and, you know, if you can stay engaged with us as we have discussions, as John said this afternoon, Janine Burke-Wells and I will be talking about PFAS at the MAWIA quarterly meeting and providing an update on that and are happy to take questions on that. There are some facilities that are looking at regional um, options. There's a couple of facilities in Massachusetts and uh, Rhode Island that are joining together. And we have a lot of discussions about this in a residuals work group with the state coordinators that um, I host across our region. But we talk a lot with Kathy, folks from MassDEP and from the other states too. So if you do have questions, you can reach out also. Great, thank you for that update. And it would be terrific if you wouldn't mind posting the, um, the link to the report. Um, and I have to note, we were asking the wastewater industry to respond um, at the height of the pandemic. Um, so it, it definitely presented a challenge to everybody. So um, thanks to those of you who did respond to that survey. Um, so the next question- And I saw Jeff posted, um, you know, a $40 a ton figure for, for you know, what they, they were quoted. So- Okay. We may, continue, it... to, we may continue to be getting information and I, I just, you know, I'd note that it continues to be, um, you know, it's going to be an active area, you know, and, and it's an area right now where it, it, it's going to be challenging, you know, given, you know, we're, we're awaiting some additional guidance from the federal government on what are good disposal and destruction options. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, you know, ongoing discussions about, you know, what to do. In Maine has already you know, adopted an approach to biosolids and residual. We're still working on it, DEP. I know other states are working on it. I think Connecticut put out an interim number um, a few weeks ago. You know, the, the idea of really continuing, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be, you know, we're gonna need to all stay in touch because as different regulatory approaches develop, as different options for 
dealing with it, hopefully get a closer look and, you know, simply just staying in touch with regard to what the, who, who the facilities are that, that would be in a position to take it. it it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be something we're all going to keep needing to work on in 2023. I'll jump back into and add that um, we are working on a potential um, option looking at a bio hub in New England to join with all of our member states and look at different technologies. We're just in the beginning stages of those discussions. However, one of the first initial requests um, was in Maine of the Maine Water Environment um, association along with Nebra, um, putting a survey out to facilities, asking them, what are your costs? What has been changing? Um, I'm probably going to take that same survey and at some point in 2023, send it around to Massachusetts. So if that is something that people are interested in and hopefully will respond to, it would be really helpful, helpful for us to gather data to be able to understand across our region uh, what the cost increase is. That's very helpful. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we also have a related question that I think you've pretty much answered um, most of this, Commissioner, but I'll just read it out loud um, from David Deist of the uh, MWRA. Um, any mass DEP updates on regulatory direction for PFAS relative to AOS permit holders and beneficial use of biosolids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's still a it, yeah you're right. I touched on it, and it it is still a work in progress, and it is going to be an area that we're going to have to be back at in 2023. Um, you know, uh, we're we're doing more and more work in terms of trying to determine, you know, what's in biosolids. Um, we've done some work on that. We've um, we are there has been a work group that was together um, um, you know, a while ago. It hasn't met recently, but we're thinking of bringing the group back together because um, you know, thinking about what we're gonna do with, with sludges, with biosolids, you know, what is the future of land application? Um, these are all things that, that you know, we need to worry about as regulators. Um, you need to be worried about as um, you know, entities looking for uh, reasonable and safe disposal options. There's a big consumer. Um, there's uh, you know a big consumer element here. You know when we were talking with the agriculture um, community representatives yesterday, who um, you know they want to know if they've historically land applied or what what materials they can take. So um, what our agency is doing is, uh, you know, we've taken the time since we last got together with the stakeholder group, and I think Kathy is, is planning to bring them back together again in 2023, is, you know, to think about what do we know about this? Um, you know, what is the latest science? You know, what are the, what are, what is the science we would need to know to be able to, you know, fully be able to assess risks from various types of exposure pathways, which we have to worry about. What are the best ways to, you know, do we have good, accurate ways of sampling and capacity to sample? And then, you know, we take all of that and think about what the regulatory approach would be. Um, you know, some states are ahead of us. I think Maine did it via legislation. We're looking at doing this, um, uh, we're looking at doing this um, via, uh, you know, a regulatory approach, although I will note that there is a legislative task force that met. Um, they've focused some on this issue. We're expecting in the new legislative session, you know, there will be PFAS bills, which is an opportunity. Hopefully there will be, you know, not only, you know, directives to agencies like ours to do things, but also, you know, some discussion about resources to help. Uh, people trying to confront this issue, um, you know, the, with this changing, with this changing uh, scientific and regulatory landscape. So lots to come. I don't have a good answer today, but but we're we're continuing to we're continuing to work on it. That's right. We're also mindful that EPA is developing its draft drinking water MCL, which will have a link to um, how everyone in the country responds to residuals management. Mm -hmm. um, 
Let's see, we do have some costs from David for the MWRA. So if folks are interested in that, um, he's he put in his uh, the rates for 2018, which were $25 per dry ton for land application. And now in 2022, they're at $44 per dry ton. Um, landfill costs uh, could be $179 per dry ton in 2022 and between 300 and 400 um, dollars per dry ton in 2024. Someone else has mentioned later on um, that these rates sound like they don't include trucking costs, which have also exploded. Um, so there's a, a nice discussion here on the, you know, in the chat, if you're interested in um, real life experience and costs from um, some of your, your fellow operators. Um, Let's see, there's a question here from Jeff Combs. I think um, maybe more to the to the group and, and less to uh, the commissioner, but do we need private companies to be involved in sludge disposal? Or, or maybe it is for the state too, or can the state assist in sludge disposal? Uh, we need facilities in Massachusetts to accept product. This is a budget buster for many communities moving forward. Um, so those are all really important comments about the issue. Right, and, and you know, again, we, we don't have a good answer today, but you know, certainly when we are thinking as DEP about it, we're thinking broadly, not just the, you know, the regulation piece, which you know, is daunting as well, but as uh, Kathy indicated, we're, we're in touch uh, you know, th with, with you and with our other states and with organizations like New Weepik saying, you know, what are options? Because, you know, it's it's one thing to say if, you know, the landscape is going to change for land application, you know, then that creates additional pressures on the market for addressing it. You know, we are going to need to work together to identify where the safe and, and manageable opportunities are for for disposing of the material but but right now you know we're we're in a market where costs are going up the number of facilities um, are limited and we're trying to we're trying to work together with our our colleague states to see what we can do on a regional level to um, you know help with that issue I don't so, see any other questions in the chat. I don't know if anybody's got anything or if they want to unmute. I think William's got his hand up. Uh, yeah, I guess on a, a lighter but easier note, hopefully, um, some of my op have been expressing uh, that they'd like to have more in-person training opportunities for upgrading their wastewater license and, and general training. Um, are there any in-person op uh, opportunities uh, being made more available or that I could look into? I can take that one. NUI is meeting in person. Uh, New England Water Environment Association, all of that's in person. All of their specialty conferences are in person throughout the, the region. National or uh, the annual NUIA conference is coming up end of January. That will be in person. Maui uh, qu quarterly meeting, I believe, is going to meet in person at some point this year. Um, so, so I would recommend NUIA for, for in person right now. Exam prep stuff, I do believe at the end of the spring, NUIA PIC will be running some in person um, exam prep classes as well. Okay, thanks for that information, John. Um, anybody else with a question? Um, I it, Oh, it looks like Wendy Leo from MWRA. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Um, so the, the sewage notification regulation um, requires this um, notice in the environmental monitor of the final public notification plans and requires permittees to accept comments. 
And we just want to make sure that the comments, the way I read the regulation, we basically just pass any comments that we receive onto DEP. I don't know if, um, I, it says DEP, let, the regulation then says DEP will consider all the comments and basically tell permittees uh, if they need to change anything. And I just wanted to make sure that um, we're not supposed to separately do something else with the, um, with the comments. It looks, it looks like, like Logan has his hand up. Yes. Hi, Randy. Thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner and Kathy. Um, so this week, the uh, DEP did send out a, C a final CSO plan template uh, mm -hmm. for people to use. And um, it does have information in there about how to file the environmental monitor uh, public notice in it, um, get, get some instructions because of the time, there's kind of some timing issues about how, um, when you have to submit the notice to them in order for it to be published in the publication that occurs two weeks, um, you know, um, every two weeks, uh, so twice a month. Um, in terms of comments to your question, Wendy, I think that that uh, DEP, the, the permittees are also supposed to submit their comments to DEP at the same time. So there, there shouldn't be a need for you to pass on comments to us if you've received them on your plans. People who wish to comment on other people's plans uh, would certainly appreciate receiving you know, any comments that you make. Um, and, you know, like um, uh, DEP and others, I think anytime you see a comment, if it's a sensible comment, makes sense and, and seems to provide some uh, useful information or, or alternative approach, then, you know, please consider it and consider adopting it into, um, you know, into your final CSO plan as DEP would approve it. We'll be looking at those comments and, um, you know, having, uh, consideration of those comments um, before we approve final plans. Okay, thanks. And, and I appreciate um, the uh, information, the template and the, um, and the sample uh, environmental monitor notice that's really helpful as we, as we put this stuff together that the instructions are pretty clear. I just wasn't right. sure whether if somebody submits comments only to us, we need to, because the monitor notice doesn't it says you can comment to DEP, you can comment to, or the permittee. It doesn't really say that you have to send the same comments to both. So we may be getting different comments and we'll just pass those along that, that and would be consider helpful. them as well. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Weldon. Um, looks like we have another question here um, from Michael Carrigan. And it is um, having to plan on sludge activities for 2023. Do we anticipate any changes to land application during this year? Or if changes are made, will they not take place until 2024? Um, it's, it's a great question. And, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do in 2023. Um, you know, there are... Um, things that we're going to be doing in early 2023 to get the groups back together again to be able to to think about all of those questions i would say generally speaking you know when when dep um does implement rules or does make changes there is an opportunity for comment there's also a recognition that there will be some time for compliance and with pfas one thing we've learned and hopefully our website is partial evidence of that as well as the you know the other types of means we do there will be a lot of communication so we may be you know it may be that we will be putting out additional data um, additional analyses that that may um, be important to your decision making but we will make sure that we are also following our usual processes for rulemaking and and you know making you know regulatory changes Um, one of the things I failed to do, and I've been doing this meeting with you all for, for almost three years now, and I committed the ultimate uh, rookie mistake of failing to recognize that we have a representative of the SRF program here and asking her for an update, which I should have done at the beginning of that. So 
you know, we can go back to questions and comments, but my apologies, Robin and um, no Robin, worries. Uh, McNamara from the SRF program. Any any updates you'd like to provide to the group? Of course. Good morning. No worries, Commissioner. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we are we Mass DEP and the uh, Clean Water Trust are working on the loan commitments for the 2022 IEP projects. Those commitments should be out before the end of the year. We're also working on the draft 2023 IUP, and um, we're happy to report that the capacity for the 2023 IUP is similar to that in 2022. Um, thankfully, we've gotten um, wonderful federal funding to help us with that. So there's a $900 million program in the Clean Water SRF and a $375 million in the Drinking Water SRF. Um, we anticipate that to be out by the end of the year or the first of the year, and we will start the 30 day comment period um, just soon after that. Also of note in 2023 is that we will have the ability to accept on a rolling basis loan applications for both planning projects and PFAS design projects. Um, this will be on a first come first serve basis while we have funding. And um, the wonderful part about this is that applicants do not have to submit a PEF, a project evaluation form to apply for this. And that's my update, thank you. Great, thank you, Robin. And again, apologies. I... No problem. <laughs> okay, great. So um, whether there are questions now for Robin or anybody else, Kathy, anything coming in? I don't see any further questions yet, so yeah. Neither people can put things in the chat or if somebody wants to raise their hand or unmute themselves, this is a this is a fine time to do that. Looks like we don't have any uh, any additional takers. So um, with that, I know folks are busy, so we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll wrap up here. Um, Want to really say, um, you know, uh, as we come to the end of of not only the calendar year but the end of the Baker Polito administration, how um, how much I value being able to work with all of you. Um, it was uh, uh, again my hats off to you um, every day, as I pointed out in a number of our conversations over the years. Um, you really are on the front lines of public health and environmental protection, um, doing difficult jobs for, uh, to provide an absolutely essential service to the public. I've appreciated our opportunities to work together, and particularly in this, in this opportunity that we've had over the past two and a half years dealing with some extraordinary things. So um, once again, thank you very much. I think we won't schedule a next meeting. I think we'll leave that to the new administration to work with Kathy and, and Weldon and those folks to set up a new time. But if, if, uh, if I have any say in the matter, I hope uh, this type of forum uh, continues because I think it's an invaluable um, exchange of information. So, so with that, I wanna wish everybody a happy holiday. Once again, uh, Denny Dart, congratulations. Um, and, um, you know, all the best. And uh, I wish everybody a, a, a wonderful new year. So take care. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everyone.